Uh, welcome back to Online Darts, everyone. Match play is in the can, so of course we had to get Matt back in. Matt, we spoke probably three weeks before the match play. It's now in the ledger. Did it hit every box you want it to? Yeah, I, I thought it was a really good match play. It had lots of stories. It's a lot of stories when you get to the world match play. The one that I say always is the big one for me. Two years versus the one year. The best of the two years versus the most informed players in regards to the one. And they delivered. It, it was a good tournament. But once again, we got to see that the seeds are just that much better than the rest of the pack. Yeah, because it was being built that the seeds could do or be in danger. But mm. effectively, they weren't. Four. Four was how many lost. Now, of those, when you look at the, the non-seeds, there's so many games where you thought that could be an upset, that could be an upset, that could be an upset. But again, the seeds just confirmed that maybe the ranking system, as much as it may need tweaking, isn't as far away from the true reflection as people may think it is. Yeah, it, it, it was a weird one because obviously all eyes were on one game in round one, which was MVG mm. against Luke Littler. And going into it, I don't mind putting my hands up. I thought Michael was in trouble. Yep, same. But that's the most focus I think I've ever seen him for one game in a long, long time. He went into that game not worrying about the match play. It almost felt like he had a point to prove against Luke. Point to prove was exactly what I was just about to say there because I suppose he's lost to Luke quite a bit recently, certainly since Luke's came on the scene. The attention's gone away from Van Gerwen. He probably feels people are overestimating his ability, and I kind of picked that up a little bit from the interview you did with him yourself at the match play when he says, everyone's beatable, Luke Littler's beatable, and people need to realise he's beatable and remember he's beatable. And I thought, you probably are getting a little bit offended here by potentially the overestimation of Luke Littler about how far he's going to go. The fact he's favourite for the World Championships when we've got a dominant world number one in Luke Humphreys right now. So I, I get what Michael's saying there, but Luke Littler is a special talent. He's going to be what people think he is. He just wasn't on this occasion at the match play and it's since come to light. There's some personal things going on for Luke. Great to see that Luke went to the Cheshire Open as well. He always stuck to his roots. He's always sort of watched the Super Series still and been involved wherever he can. He's someone who's not let it go to his head, and I think that's going to put him in good stead moving forward to get back onto that winning run. How much did Michael need that result? It's tough because I think if you ask Michael, he will say he didn't, and it's just he's still the world number one. Michael will tell you that. But I think when you look at it from an outsider's point of view, we look at it and say he kind of needed that. So until Michael believes he needs it, though, he doesn't really need it. And when does Michael believe he ever needs a win or he's not the world number one? I think when that day comes, I don't think we see Michael anymore anyway. So I think that's when he steps away from the sport. Until then, I think he'll fully believe that he's the world number one regardless. Again, sensationalised headlines when Luke Littler loses that anyone think they just lost to someone that had never played the game before let alone one of the greatest that's ever thrown. But again, the, the national newspapers and the casual darts audience seem to go into meltdown whenever he loses. And it's not doing himself, it's not doing Luke any favours, these headlines, are they? The, the ones that get me are the ones that when he loses a pro tour event. Then the, and they try and even advertise, like, oh, no one turned up to watch the game. No one's allowed to turn up to watch the game. It's a pro tour. So, yeah, I, I think sometimes journalists need to just go back to the qualifications and do their research because a lot of the time especially with the internet a lot of the time you you sort of see something and then that's it you've read it um, a lot of people will read a headline a YouTube title a YouTube thumbnail they don't even watch the video to see what the content's about they'll make their opinion based on the title of the video they don't even realise the context. And they've got to go back into to find the context, understand understand what you're writing about. I won't speak about anything I don't understand. And I, if I do go to talk about a different topic, I'm going to research it to the hill so I look like I know what I'm on about. Because the worst thing is what's going on right now. People talking about something they don't understand. And that's where you get those sensationalised headlines. Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, Weird that Gary Anderson got involved with the crowd during this game of Michael. So it's something that he doesn't normally do. Now we discussed this on the live lounge. I want to take your, get your take on it. That for me, this is the most content I've ever seen Gary Anderson in himself, in his game, where he genuinely couldn't care. He's just up there for win or win. If I lose, I lose. He got involved, he 
informed everyone that England had lost, had, had lost 2 1, and he just without a care in the world. What a dream position to be in, eh? I'd love to be in that position where you could just go up, do something you're one of the best in the world at, and really not care. But think about age, think about the journey he's been on. He's probably at peace with it. He probably is at peace. And, you know, if he walked away tomorrow, I think he'd still be at peace. You know, I don't think there's anything more Gary Anderson needs to prove. There's probably things he still wants to do, but isn't chasing them with the same sort of desire that happened before. And I think we do see that a little bit. Statistically, Gary Anderson's the best player in the world. It's not transferring to TV events though at the moment. Maybe that is just purely because he's not got that little bit of fire. But we know one thing for sure. Gary Anderson, when the World Championships come around, that is when he plays his best. He goes down there for days beforehand. I've been in the World Championship around when Gary Anderson was. Gary Anderson was on days after me, and he was there when I got there. So he's there, he's practicing with different people, he takes that event so serious. I think come the Worlds, that's when we see Gary Anderson. We'll touch on what you said there, because you've been in this environment. To compete at the very elite level on TV, which they are, does that fire have to be there? This is a very, very hard thing to explain. You have to go somewhere else, mentally. And sometimes we see that in a persona. Peter Wright is not Peter Wright. Peter Wright and Snakebite Peter Wright are two different people. He's not this flamboyant, colourful party animal. He's actually a quiet, reserved family man. And he has to go to that place to be allowed him to, to play. We saw the same with Paul Nicholson. Paul Nicholson isn't the Paul Nicholson, the asset. That is a different person. The asset is different to Paul Nicholson. And you have to go to a different place. And if you go up there as yourself, it's tricky because you're not committed, you're not invested in a game, you're not, you're not going with it. And to go to that place is very hard because to go to that place, you've got a full confidence, belief. And when you go to that place and you're not winning, you go to that place and you don't get the result, you go to that place. It's often called as being in the zone. It's a very hard mental state to build up to. But when you start losing or you're not getting the results, you daren't go there. It's a horrible place to be, especially when you don't win. And that disappointment is unbearable at times. Sometimes like when you're standing behind a player and they're on a finish and you're waiting, the easiest thing to do is to stand there and go, they're not good. They're gonna hit this because it sets you up for that disappointment. Because the worst thing to do is be sat waiting with double 16, start your preparation, I want 32, I want 32, and then they take it out, and then you just get that sinking feeling throughout the body. So ultimately, sometimes you don't invest in that moment. And it's, like I say, it's so hard to explain, and I'm normally quite good with words, but trying to explain what that mindset is like for someone who's not gone to that place before, it's a really tricky thing. Anyone who's been there will understand what I'm talking about. And that doesn't mean going to a world championships or going anywhere. That state of mind could be anywhere because whether it's your Sunday League Cup final, your body will react the same way to a Sunday League Cup final as it would the FA Cup final. You can't differentiate your body reaction based on how important it is in perception to the world. That moment, that is the biggest thing you're playing in. So you'll get the same reaction as those players. It's not like it gets harder, like you get a higher state of arousal, you've hit the peak. So yeah, a lot of people would have experienced it and know what I mean, but unless you haven't, it's so hard to explain. But Gary Anderson, he'll have that at the Worlds. Luke Humphreys, is he on the way to cementing himself as one of the all-time greats of this sport, even at this early age? What he's doing, the title he's winning, the performance he's putting in, this is returning into one of the most incredible years to date. I think he's winning it to two million. I think he's winning it to two million. Um, I think he's going to be the world number one for a long time. Yes, he's got a lot of money to defend in a couple of years, but he's going to add to that now that's going to keep him a gap. He's £600,000 ahead as things stand. I said years ago, every time I mentioned Luke Humphreys, certainly when I started my YouTube channel, I used to always say, Luke Humphreys, future world champion, Luke Humphreys, future world champion. People said, can you not mention Luke Humphreys' name without saying future world champion? This doesn't surprise me at all. I saw something very special in Luke Humphreys from a very young age, and as did a lot of people, he's blossomed now into that player, and a really good sort of ambassador for the sport. When you look at what he was to where he is now in terms of physical appearance and conditioning, to where his mind is, to the fact he nearly pulled out of the sport because of mental health concerns. 
nearly pulled out of a world championship match halfway through because of that. So this just goes to show this work that can be done away from the hockey that can help a lot of people and Luke Humphrey should be an ambassador for the sport the way he is. He is absolutely getting everything right and that darts in a great place for Luke as number one. Well champion, add to the match play to it. Every round over a ton average. Mm. One of the all-time great match plays. Oh yeah. Um, possibly not Peter Wright territory when Peter Wright did it a few years ago. And I'd say that's down to just a slight tweak in level, but also the context. Because Peter Wright said before a dart was thrown, I'm going to go do this. And then he did. Which just adds more story. Every round, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, they can't touch me. Yeah. Where Luke's more humble approach doesn't make quite as much of a, it's more about the darts, which is great, you know, great for the treasure. But I'm, I'm a wrestling fan. I, I, I like the story. Tell the story. <laughs> yeah, I like a story around the, the performance. So Luke was great for performance, Peter Wright was great for performance and story. So I'm still going with Peter Wright. Is he going to take some dislodging this year? So if anyone wins something, are they going to have to beat him along the way? Well, look like what Luke Little had to do to stop him in the Premier League. That's what you've got to do. You've got to beat Luke Humphreys. Small play on words. Lose a game, beat the player. Now, Luke Humphreys isn't going to lose no games. By that, I mean he's not going to give you a chance. You're not going to be missing. You're not going to capitalise on his mistakes. If you beat Luke Humphreys, it's because you play better than Luke Humphreys. He'll shake your hand, he'll smile, he'll say, well played, great game, and then he'll go win the next tournament. That, that's sort of how I see it with Luke at the moment. And to beat him, you're going to have to be elite. You're going to need a nine data somewhere. You're going to need a big finish. You're going to need multiple shots where you're 110, 115, 140. Those sort of shots, you're going to need to take a lot of those out. You're going to go through the ringer, but ultimately he's beatable, but you've got to be good. The way the match play went for a lot of people, there was a little bit of spike and a little bit of prickiness from players from the first time in a while. We saw it from Luke when he said mm. Dimitri's reaction wasn't natural. Fight this, he's going to have it back and yep. things like this. We saw it from, from James Wade as, as well, saying he feels undervalued, underappreciated. He still feels he's better than half the people a, a, above him. We had James Wade versus Phil Bars. Uh, correct, as yep. always. <laughs> but there, there was a little bit of needle creeping back in. Do we think we've turned a corner perhaps and... We are going down that road again. I'm going to do my uh, my Wade impression and throw a question back at you. Um, what was your most viewed interviews at the match play? Three James Wade, a Luke Humphreys, and a Michael Smith. James Wade's great. <laughs> three, all three of them. Yeah. And the reason for that, he didn't play it safe. He said what he thought, whether people had agreed or disagreed. Now we've had this conversation many times off camera. For me, the most important thing is that somebody cares. Somebody cares. The worst thing that can happen is you record a video, you do an interview with someone, you put it out and no one watches it. That, that's the worst thing that can happen. What you want is you want people to either dislike what they're saying or to like what they're saying, to draw emotion, because them as someone in front of the camera who's putting out a piece of content, a bit of work, a, an entertainment program, a sports program, whatever you're doing, you want someone to feel something when they watch you speak, perform, whatever you're doing. James Wade did that. Whether you agreed with him or you disagreed, you cared. And it worked. Brilliant. We're, we're developing now a character. I want to see how James Wade gets on. I want to see what he does next. I want, to, I want him to get through because I want him to sit down and have another interview with Phil Bars. <laughs> you know, so you, you've got all these different aspects. Stephen Bunting. For the first time, a player went to the stage and there was actually dedicated signs properly to the work Stephen Bunting's done off camera away from the broadcast. There was a chance, let's go bunting mental. <coughs> For the first time, players cared who won. Yeah. We are starting to see that twist and that, ke that turn. Because until now, all people go to the darts for is to see a nine darter, 180s, watch some good darts, have a drink, have a good time. At no point now do they go, I've got to go Monday because he's playing. I want to see how that goes. They go to the darts because the darts comes first. Maybe now we're getting what I've wanted all along, that players are starting to draw a Because like you say, James Wade, three interviews, 
way above everybody else. Was it because James Wade outperformed everyone and played better darts than everybody else? No. Was it because James Wade won the championship? No. James Wade was the most interesting. I love it. I, 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 we're seeing it go, we're seeing it turn. Bunting and Wade could be leading that way and hopefully we'll see more. Dimitri Vandenberg, you mentioned. Everyone picking up on it. I, I said it myself in my stuff I did on YouTube that I don't like watching him anymore. But all of a sudden, he's made me care. All of a sudden, now I care what happens, whether I want him to lose because I don't want to watch him again or whatever. It, it works because now I care about a Dimitri Vandenberg result. Did you, do you think everyone cared about every single match in the World Match Play? 16 first round games? There'll be games people probably didn't even watch. How do them people make them games watchable? It's not by just throwing loads of 180s and really good stuff because 100 averages now, we've seen it, we see it all the time. We, we want something a little bit different and there's people doing it and it excites me. We even had Andrew Gill in the scarf as well. Mm. In the Winter Gardens, a genuine picture of an Andrew Gilding scarf. Was that Dan Dawson, was it? No, it wasn't. It was a genuine fan of an Andrew Gilding scarf. Right, OK. Yeah, yeah, so mark that one down. Yeah, yeah. Injuries in darts, and this is very topical because of the situation that Nathan Aspinall finds himself in. Really open and honest at the match play. Basically, that I'm going to try and defend my title. Do I think I can? No, yeah. because the arm's in bits. But we're seeing more and more injuries come in and more and more big injuries. I know you've been through a lot with your wrist as well. Why are these coming into the sport now? A couple of reasons. Um, increased calendars. So if you think before, in darts it was very world championships, then the match play came in, a couple of events in between. Then you got the pro tours, the European tours, everything else that comes in between. But then the practice, people now practicing more than ever. They're practicing because they need to try and get the edge, they're trying to be better, which means more time. Darts is standing as still and static as possible and applying an explosive movement, dropping onto joints. Because you're literally dropping the arm, the, the weight of that throw onto joints. So repetitive strain injuries are going to come in a lot, and I think it's going to be a lot. This is now, more so than ever, where coaching is important. And when I say this, I'm about to give you the headline, aren't I? <laughs> when I say this, I don't mean the 90 plus percent of coaches that are out there in the darts world at the moment who don't know what they're doing. I mean qualified professionals who understand how the body works, who understand all these different aspects. I've got a degree and the people I've been working with in understanding the body recently and how it works with darts have opened my eyes to a whole new level and I'm to degree qualification. And I'm looking at things thinking, what on earth? You're telling me that actually an issue I'm facing could be because I've got tight hamstrings. But it actually comes down to because the hamstrings were tight, it was turning the pelvis, which, are, and it works all the way through. And some of the stories you hear, like people who have like issues with the back and it's due to like the jaw and the strain and the tension, of the muscle. And it's crazy how like all these different aspects link, but we need proper professionals we need obviously ex-professionals and people within the sport who understand darts to work with this alongside it but now more so than ever is it important that people who understand all these factors are involved in the sport you say the calendars are are overpacked which i agree with at the elite level but maybe not towards the bottom end how do we get this balance and act this is the this is the tough bit um who do you want me to speak as here? Like um, as Matthew Edgar, the fan that that knows what they're talking about, not as a player. Yeah. How do you you know what's going on? You've been through this. How would you sort this issue out? It's so tricky because I can give you six different answers. One of the answers would be there is no issue because. Ultimately, people want to see familiarity and faces and main event players and all this, you know, as such. Um, if that's the case, then only have 32 tour cards. Get rid of the rest. I've said this before in the fact that at the moment, the tour doesn't support 128 players, so why have we got 128 players on it? If it supports 64 players, why is it not a 64 player tour? So, yeah, I get that. Um, I mean, the simple fix is to limit the restrictions. But then where does that cut off be? If you say the bottom 64 can play in other events and things, what happens if you're number 65? What happens if you're number 63 and you've, you drop out and then go back in and, you know, can you dibble in and out? So where is that cut off and where is that lie? Because that horizon's gonna cause some tricky ground. So that's where I don't think that is possible. 
if we're now going to talk about me from if I was involved in an organisation, what would I do? I would bring back the old Championship of Darts. Remember, was it Crondon Park? Yeah, yeah. Championship, Championship of Darts. It was aimed at the top 32 then. It shouldn't be aimed at the top 32, they're catered for. We should be looking 32 to 64. That gives you a reason now to be in the top 64. It's going to make more professional players. It's going to give those players access to streamed events, which is going to be great for their sponsors. It's going to give them opportunities to, to appear and win and play on a regular basis. So it gives you a reason to be in the top 64. The PDC has got a great staircasing system. 128 get your tour card, 64 keep it, 32 get the World Championship, 16 match play and grunt. But you, you know the staircasing system as you like, 24 masters. But that really starts from 32. Let's put a step below. Let's go 32 to 64 or 32 to 96. Let's look at those players. Because if you don't want to do the situation, there's two fixes. Situation one, championship of darts. Make the players earn it. Make them battle it out against their own abilities and their own levels. Battle it out for this prize fund. Or start paying the first round lose on the Pro Tour. There's two potential fixes there for me on that. But one of the things, that, that's how to solve that. But the other thing, the PDC have already solved it a little bit. And this is where now I've got to put my other hat on. Got so many hats here and like you know how my uh, scheduling works i've got all these different companies and hats that i have to put and now putting on the pdc hat the pdc have already done that they've gone from pro tours behind closed doors to pro Tours on stream to two streams to four streams now i've got four streaming boards on the pro tour that means 25 percent of the matches are going to be streamed at all times which give players access to streams events, allow them to get their sponsors on stream, allow them to play in front of those cameras and to have that opportunity. The UK Open has gone from one board to two to all eight boards now being streamed. So the access the players are getting to those opportunities are increasing all the time. The bar's been lowered. Who's going to take the opportunity? I'm going to go back to something you said. So right now, how many players do you think the tour can comfortably cater for? As full-time professionals? As full-time professionals, how many can the tour sustain comfortably? 64. 64. Um, I, I was always around the 64 cut-off, and I was a professional player. That was my income. That was my job. I didn't have a job as well. I lived off of that. Because it's not just the prize money. Because of the opportunity the PDC provides with streams and different things like this, you obviously get uh, sponsorship. The more opportunity to stream events, the more opportunity to sponsorships and endorsements and everything that comes with that. More people are seeing you play with your darts, which means your dart sales and people get royalty on dart sales. Uh, so there's all these different factors going on as well in the background. So 64 comfortably. I think that's going to extend a little bit more now we've seen the prize money go up on the Pro Tour. And with more opportunity, it could go even further down. I think we're a long way off of getting 128 though. The only way we get 128 is guaranteed salary for Q school winners. With these injuries, and I want to ask about the ranking system, because other ranking systems in the world have got some kind of injury protection hmm. to it. Are we getting to the point now where darts potentially needs to look at something like that? Because these injuries are caused by playing. Yeah, um, yes and no. Oh, again, I, I, I'm going to put two cat. I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give you two. I, I, it's hard. Uh, answer from a player's point of view, I'd loved it because my injury started when I was playing in world championships and I was in the tour and I couldn't stop playing because I couldn't afford to, one, because it was my job, two, because I'd drop out of the rankings. So I couldn't afford to stop playing. So I had to keep, keep on with what I was doing. The next thing is, from the other point of view, I think people would manipulate it. Who's to say, let's think of an example, I'm going to use it because I'm sure we wouldn't mind me using it as an example. Glenn Durant. When Glenn Durant was pulling out of Pro Tours mid-match because psychologically he was fried at the time and he was on a big losing run, but he's still in the top 32. What's to say at that point, he doesn't just go, I pulled my tricep, I can't play for three months. Step away and protect his ranking. And then how long is that ranking protected for? Does he go in, in, in July, I'm going to drop out the rankings here, so I'm going to freeze my ranking, come back for the World Championship, I'll still be in the top 32, I'm seeded now for the, World, for the World Championships. It will be manipulated, I can tell you now. I stood there at those screens at a Pro Tour for 11 years, 
And as soon as someone walks in and they're limping or they show a sign of weakness, everyone's like, I want him. I want him. It's ruthless. And they all stood there at the screen. And when it comes up, you, lucky, you've got him. He's playing rubbish. So it would be manipulated. I can guarantee you that. I don't know who would do it. And by the way, Glenn wouldn't have done that. Just no, no, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. It was just an example in regards. Um, but it would be manipulated. I 100% stand by you'd get so many people protect their rankings just because they didn't want to defend. Or they'd come up to a bit like, imagine um, Ross Smith defending the European Championships. If he pulled out with injury a month beforehand, does he keep the 100 grand for another year when he goes past the European Championships? So it, it just wouldn't work. So I'd like to see it from a player's point of view, but I also get that it's impossible. So as a player, like you said, you wanted to, but couldn't afford to stop playing. Mm. You made the injury worse, same as Nathan Aspinall. Yeah. So how do we get past that? Because in any other sport, if you're genuinely injured, you have doctors that don't let you play. Yeah, yeah. You're medically told, look, we are not letting you play. So is there a care of duty to players then to say, hang on a minute, medically you're not cleared to play? Insurance. I sit now on the back end of what I did and I look back and I'm like, there's all these different options. The problem is, I'm going to just put it as blunt as possible, dart players are tight asses. They will stop in the cheapest hotels, in the cheapest flights. If we sat on Ryanair flights at two o'clock in the morning, sat there on a, what was basically a pro tour flight, all the players just sat on the, this cheap midnight flight. And it's like, why? You know, very rarely do, do players actually go for an upgrade or go for the nicer sort of travel. And you look back at it now and you think, what was we all thinking? Insurance. People won't do it because they're like, oh, I don't want to pay that just in case. And I've got to get sportsman insurance, which is going to cost more. And what, what's the point? Where actually, that's the way the sport is going. I know the PDPA are looking into things such as that as well. And they've always got things. Um, I would dare say, 90% of people that drive a car to Pro Tours aren't insured correctly to drive the car because they won't have proper sportsman insurance. It'll just be, It'll just be insurance. Fair pie, fire effect, yeah, fair, yeah. Fully, yeah, yeah. The cheapest, whatever the meerkat tells them to get. So it's one of those things where the, the culture of the sport, but that culture's changing because people that are coming into the sport now are coming from a professional background. I came from a pub and a club. That, that, that was the, well, the back end of that era. The modern era is academies, development systems and all these. So it's going to change. It's just we're in that change in the guard. Matt, it's an absolute pleasure catching up with you here at the Super Series. I know we've got a shift to do tonight. So yeah. <laughs> we've, we've done half an hour. So it's an absolute pleasure, buddy. Brilliant. Cheers, Phil.